Father God, we lift up Saeed to you and Nagme and Jacob and Rebecca and pray for a reuniting. We pray for him to be able to come home. We look forward to hearing from him so many stories of how you worked through him, how you've rescued him so often over there in that miserable place with people literally wanting to kill him on a daily basis. But he's still around. So we ask God that you would bring him home, but you'd also keep him safe in the meantime and use him mightily. Keep Nagme close to you. As she said, she's going to be fasting and praying again, drawing closer to you. She's withdrawn from so many of the things she'd been doing to champion for him and to just focus on talking with you. So we look forward to the day when you bring him home, but until then, keep them all safe. And Lord, as we look to your word, boy, <laughs> this first part of the book of Romans does not paint a pretty picture of us. I pray, Lord, that we would recognize that though there is a lot of knocking down that the Apostle Paul did, then there's building up because then we get to see ourselves from your perspective and what you've done for us. So we pray for understanding now, Lord. We pray for a clear knowledge and wisdom in knowing what you're speaking. We ask your Holy Spirit to be our teacher in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're in the book of Romans in chapter 2. Now, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been going somewhere and you were absolutely sure that you knew how to get there only to find out you were wrong? Probably doing that now with Deuteronomy. You knew where it was. Wait a minute. No, it's not. Someone moved it. (laughs) Hopefully not. But I'm telling you this, too. If you're a man and you're lost, you aren't lost because you're not going to ask anyone how to get there, right? Not going to ask for directions. But I'll tell you, thinking you know where something is and then you don't, it can shock you. You can be like, what is going on? This is what the GPS said and what the map said to do. Well, I'll tell you, Paul is telling the Jews that their GPS, which actually for them is God's plan of salvation, is different than they thought. After clearly stating the condition of unbelievers in chapter 1, Paul began chapter 2 by addressing the problems that the Jews had in their faith. These problems were based on a very simple thing, just a misunderstanding of the law of God that he gave to Moses. So this time we'll look at more of what Paul had to say about the Jews. And I call this message, Lost in the Law. There you go. So verse 17. Indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who, even with your written code and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor a circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but... He is a Jew who was one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So, starting in verse 17, indeed you are called a Jew. So Paul just says this for simple identification. He says, you guys are Jews, you're Jews by heritage, you're Jews by nationality, that's correct. And you rest on the law. See, the Jews had the law. We in America have kind of a a saying. We call it, uh, we say, possession is nine-tenths of the law. You ever heard that one? used to hate that when I didn't have something and someone else had it, and even if it's mine, 
they might say, well, possession is nine-tenths of law, man, you're out. Oh, I didn't like that. It means basically this. Ownership is easier to maintain if you have possession of something, and ownership is difficult to enforce if you do not have possession of something. Possession is nine-tenths of the law. But for the Jews, possession of the law gave them nine-tenths of nothing. That's what they were stuck with. Paul points out an interesting thing here. The Jews rested on the law. You see, the law is not supposed to be rested on. It's to be obeyed. And in order to obey the law, you cannot rest. You have to work. You have to work all the time at keeping the law and obeying it. You can't just rest because every time you rest, you lay back, you kick back, you stop working at obeying it, and you start disobeying it. That's the point of the law. It points out that you can't keep it. Another thing the Jews did, they make, make your boasting God. Now, on the surface, this sounds good. Don't we like to talk about the things that God has done? Don't we like to talk about the things, whether it's salvation in general or creation of the world or he got you that new job or you needed a car and that very day you had to get it, it went on sale or you needed that house or whatever. You were sick and you're healed. Bragging about God is great. In fact, Paul wrote in Galatians 6, 14, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you want to brag about something, you want to boast Boast about Jesus. Boast about what he did for you on the cross. But this isn't the boasting that Paul's talking about here. He's talking about the Jews boasting that they have God and nobody else does. So neener, neener. (laughs) The Jews in Paul's day believed they would all be saved just because there were Jews and nobody else would be saved. That means they would all get into heaven just because there were Jews, no matter what their behavior was like, And the rest of the people, who are called Gentiles, would wind up in hellfire. In fact, they believed that Gentiles were created to kindle the fires of hell. Thank you very much, guys. And they would be kept out just because they were Gentiles, or even worse, because they were not Jews. Now, verse 18, another thing the Jews had, and they know his will. They were given the scriptures, and they studied them a lot. They really did. And I'm glad that God gave the scriptures to the Jews because they were very diligent in in keeping them fresh. And when they would make copies, they would, when they finished a book in the Bible, they would take that copy because they knew how many letters, are you ready for this? How many letters were in each book? And they would count from the beginning to the end and they would count from the end to the beginning and then they would count to the middle and if the middle letter didn't match if any of the letters didn't match they would throw it away and do it again they wouldn't get white out or I guess it'd be tan out or brown out you know for the, sc- the scrolls they wouldn't do it they would just say it's, it's not worth it we'd get rid of it so they were very very careful in copying them. so they did a good job and that I'm very happy but they believed they knew the will of God and they felt this way about the Gentiles that the Gentiles were just for hellfire well in that study it seems like they kind of skipped over a few scriptures about the gentiles in the old testament i'll think of i got three examples from isaiah isaiah 42 6 this is speaking of the messiah i the lord have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand i will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people as a light to the gentiles Interesting, doesn't say to the Jews, to the Gentiles. In Isaiah 49, verse 6, also speaking of the Messiah. Indeed, he says, this is God the Father talking to Jesus. It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. In other words, it's not enough for you to just come and save the Jews. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. How about that? That definitely says Gentiles. In one more in Isaiah 60, verse 3, speaking of the Jews one day, the Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. So that's how the Gentiles will come to them for instruction. Now, one more, not in Isaiah, but in Malachi chapter 1, verse 11, for from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Jews. No, among the Gentiles. And if you think about this, how could that scripture be easily fulfilled? If he comes to the Gentiles who are worldwide and everywhere in the world, there are Christians, not every person in Christian, but every place in the planet, there are Christians. The sun will be shining, rising or setting. 
Remember that phrase back about the uh, British Empire? The sun never sets on the British Empire because somewhere on the planet, it's always sunny somewhere. If it's dark where you are, it's sunny someplace else on something that was run by the British Empire. And that's how it is Jesus is saying about the Gentiles being believers. That's what uh, God wrote about in Malachi, through Malachi in chapter 1, verse 11. So they had it wrong about the Gentiles, which means they were wrong about the will of God, even though they said they know his will. And then going on, and they proved the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law. They knew what the law said. They were instructed from it. So they knew what to approve of and what not to approve or what to take in proactive being disapproving of certain behaviors based on Scripture. So they knew that. And verse 19, you are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a guide to those who are in darkness. Now the Jews did get great instruction. They'd been trusted by God to bring his word to the world, as I was talking about how careful they were. But the blindness spoken of here is not physical, but spiritual blindness. Before anyone gets saved, anybody, you're blind, really, to the things of God. A lot of times you're not even interested in them. But God calls you. And it's, it's like the man who says that the Bible is really a love letter from God to us. He starts wooing you with his love and his grace toward you. And he places a desire in your heart and strengthens it for you to know him. The Jews were confident they were to be used of God to lead others to him, but the way they did that was to convert them to Judaism and to circumcise the males. They said, you've got to become a, a believer, you've got to be a Jew. In order to do that, eh, you've got to get circumcised too and make them follow the letter of the law to a T, to the very tiniest mark you have to follow it. Jesus talked about how hard these Jews made it for their converts in Matthew 23, verse 4. He said of them, For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. So they have a convert. They bring him in. They pile law after law after obeying thing after ritual after thing after thing on and on and on and on. It's kind of like... Um, how the Grinch stole Christmas and he has that huge bag of stuff. That's what they would put on you and you're like this, whoa. And then they stand back and won't even lift a little finger to help. It's so harsh. It's so hard. He's like, you guys have this so wrong. And then he goes on, Paul writes more, verse 20. You're, they were an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. They had the actual truths of God in his word. They weren't wrong in what scripture said. So they felt qualified to teach the foolish, which means senseless, foolish, stupid, which is what the Jews thought about Gentiles, and the babes who are childish, untaught, or unskilled. Now, doesn't that sound kind of condescending? Just a wee bit. <laughs> but that's how they felt. Because they didn't have knowledge and truth in the law. They had the form of knowledge and truth in the law, which is the word form means the mere form, a semblance of the truth, not the real thing. It's the same word that Paul uses in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. He says, they have a form of godliness, but they're denying its power. And from such people, turn away. And yet that's how these guys were. Paul's saying, hey, you guys had this form of that. In other words, you have the scriptures, you know what they say, you're pretty close, <laughs> but you're not really doing it right. So Paul has done a great job in setting up his main point. They are Jews. They have the law. They boast in God. They know his will. They approve the right things. They are guides to the blind and instructors to the foolish. So now he goes on. Verse 21. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? This is such an important point. It really is. Teachers must first teach themselves. You have to understand what you're teaching. I remember when um, I first started out in plumbing and the boss gave me or told me, he said, I could take a stack of invoices. This is how I'm going to train you to the point where I'll be able to give you a stack of invoices and they'll have names and addresses on them and what the job is. I'll just be able to hand that stack to you and you'll be able to just go and do all the jobs, not have to call me, maybe question about where to buy something, but that's it. You'd be so trained. And I was like, that is impossible. But you see, he could do it because he'd been trained. 
then he passed it on to me. Then he trained me, then I was training other people. <laughs> but before I got trained, I was like, there's no way I could do that. I can't. But then I could. And it was like, how could I possibly ever think I couldn't do that? It, it's just almost second nature. But at one point, I couldn't. Same thing happens with this, with teaching the Bible. I'm telling you, there are times when I'm up here, let me ask you this. You don't have to raise your hands or nod your head, but I'm, you're probably going to. Have you ever been listening to me teach and it's beating you up? The scriptures are getting to you? The scriptures, oh, wow, that's heavy. It's not me. In fact, if anything, I probably get in the way. <laughs> it's just conveying the truth of the scripture to you and it's, it's beating. It's like, wow, this is heavy. Wow, I need improvement on that. Wow, I need to stop doing that. Wow, I need to do that. That's God doing that. But so some people might say, how can you talk about that heavy stuff so easily? Like it's just common knowledge. And I say, well, I've been working on it all week. <laughs> and God's been working on me all week to the point where by the time Sunday comes around, I'm fairly comfortable with it. But it doesn't mean it didn't black my eye. It doesn't mean it didn't gouge my heart during the week. Oh, trust me, it does. And there are times when I'm up here and I'm like, you know, God, it's not your fault, but you haven't, I haven't really allowed you to get into me, but I know it's the truth, so I'm going to share it anyway. I just have to hope that nobody realizes what a mess and struggle I have in this area. Let's go on. You know, <laughs> that's that type of thing. But it's true. Whatever the topic is, the teacher must first be teachable and then be taught. Because my favorite topic, math, if you don't understand math and you don't believe that what you know about math is true, you must first be sure that you're taught about it first before you teach somebody else. That's just basic teaching 101. So that's what he's saying. If you teach another, don't you teach yourself? Don't you see what it says? Why aren't you doing that? I remember Pastor Chuck Smith was at a pastor's conference. He was teaching, and there were about seven or 800 of us in a big auditorium down in um, Murrieta. And one of the things he says, if you're going to teach the word of God, by all means, know it. <laughs> but it makes sense, doesn't it? Well, it should by now. I've harped on this topic a lot about knowing something before you teach it. So that's what he said. But it was like, whoa, kind of getting hot there. But he's, he's right to be in an upset mode if, you're, if you don't know it and you're just faking it or winging it. I heard a story about J. Vernon McGee when he was in Bible college. And he, <laughs> he went to listen to a guy who was in college, a, former, a classmate. You had a, 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 not a job, not a gig, but... To him, he might have thought it was a gig. But he would teach on Sunday nights at a local church, so Jay Vernon went to hear him. And he said, it was horrible. He messed up almost every aspect of his teaching. It's terrible. He said, I never went back except once because there was another student who wanted to go hear him teach. He said, I don't want to go again. He says, oh, you're coming. Fine. So he went along with him. And after the service, they went up to the guy, and the one who wanted to go, the third party, asked the guy who taught. He says, where did you get that sermon? And he says, well, the Holy Spirit gave it to me. He says, don't you blame that mess on the Holy Spirit. <laughs> no way that thing came from God, you know. And it's like someone who teaches math. I don't care if it's new math or not. Two and two do not make five. It just doesn't work, okay? So you got to get the same thing with the scriptures, and that's what he's saying. Now, going on specifically in verse 21, you who preach that a man should not steal. In other words, that's a good thing. Do you steal? Now, they may not steal outwardly. They may not walk into a store and just grab something or mark it in their, in their day and just put it in their robe and steal it like that or just blatantly take something from somebody and run off. But they could steal somewhat secretly. And because they were so spiritually minded, a good example for them is in Malachi 3.8. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. And then God says, but you say, in what way have we robbed you? And then God says, in tithes and offerings. Because everything we have comes from where? God. So it's really all his. I remember Pastor Chuck, again, talking when he, when he was a young man. He said, I wonder how much of my money I can give to God. And he says, as I got older, I realized, I wonder how much of God's money I can keep. It's like, Wow. <laughs> I like to say it this way. God is bad at math. You don't have enough money, so you give some to him, and all of a sudden you have enough money, or you get through. 
I am not into prosperity stuff. I'm not saying, hey, if you're broke, give God money and he'll fill your wallet. I'm not going to say that. And I'm not going to say be irresponsible and take food off of your table for your kids. But at the same time, we are to be responsible and give to God. It's what the Bible says. So a good godly teacher will never teach people to steal, but he himself should also not steal. Going on, 22, you who say, do not commit adultery. That's good. Do you commit adultery? Now, adultery is one of the sins where if we're physically committing it, somebody else obviously knows, but very few other people can, you know, there, there are ways of committing that and not having too many people know about it. But Jesus addresses that even on, on the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you may not commit that sin outwardly, but if you commit it in your heart, you're just as guilty. Men, if you look at a woman and think sexual thoughts about her, you're guilty of adultery. So some people say, well, I might as well just go ahead and do it then. No, that would be two sins because you thought about it and then you did it. And Jesus says, it's just compounding the problem. Jesus said, if you've done it in your heart, you've already committed adultery against her and with her. And the same thing with women looking at men. Now, if you want to know what the Bible says about it, it says a lot, especially in Proverbs, in the early part. Proverbs 6, verse 32. Whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. You just, in other words, to paraphrase that, you're not very smart. You're just hurting yourself, if no one else. And you obviously, it destroys other people. And so he says... Do you commit adultery if you teach people not to? Well, a good godly teacher would not teach to commit adultery, but he himself should also not commit adultery. Now, another one, you abhor idols, you hate them. Do you rob temples? That one sounds kind of weird. Apparently, people thought the Jews, at least some of them, would actually rob pagan temples. So they would, in their spiritual life, abhor idols. They would never go into that temple and pray to the God that's in that temple. First of all, they know from Scripture it's not a real God. It's just a statue. It's just an image people made out of the stuff that God made, and then they worship it. But because the law said so not to do that, they thought they were okay, but they didn't seem to mind ripping off the pagans. (laughs) Right? For us, we must be careful here too. We often treat other Christians well, but at times we have no problem ripping off what we call the heathen. Like if they work for us or if they, um, we do a job for them or they do one for us, we don't mind kind of cheating them. And you know the other way around can happen too. You can have Christians working for you. You can have Christians that you employ and they can rip you off because they think, oh, a brother to brother, he'll understand. I didn't really do the job that well or I should get paid more or I should this or that. It's just wrong. And I've, had people that are Christians that do work in the trades and I've recommended them to other people and I ask how the job went and I'm sorry to say that they're not pleased. And it's like, oh man. I've never had that experience with people come here so you guys are all safe in relation to me. So dry your brows. <laughs> in fact, it's been the other. I've, been, I've heard a lot of praise and that does happen too and good for you guys. That's great. But you see what I'm saying? It's misrepresenting God because you're supposed to be his ambassador. And I think any Christian should be the best employee and the best worker on the staff. So going on, a good godly teacher would not teach to rob temples, but he himself should also not rob temples. And then 23, you who make your boast in the law Do you dishonor God through breaking the law? That means this. We as believers, especially for us, often talk up the goodness of God and how much he has changed us. And I think that's a great thing to do. I was this way, like the blind man. I don't know what this all is to say. I was blind, but now I see. Check it out for yourself. You know, I I can't explain it. I don't know how God actually does it with the nuts and bolts working, but my heart is different. And it's not me. I can't change my own heart. He did it. And you're pointing to God. That's a great thing. We talk about scripture. We share about how much God has changed us. All of that's great. But one of the worst things we as Christians can do is sin and sin consistently in front of non-believers. 
It just drives them away from the Lord because they're looking for us to be that ambassador, that example of what a Christian is. And they know that we're believers because we've either told them or our lifestyle shows it or we've worn a Jesus-type T-shirt. I say that because I used to work in construction in California and I had Christian witness T-shirts that I would wear. And finally, one of the guys comes to me and says, Chris, you might as well not wear that. You're never going to convert me. I said, I don't wear it for you. I wear it for me. And he says, why? I said, to keep me in line. I know if I'm wearing this, I don't want to take God to that place. I don't want to act like that around other people when I'm supposed to be a Christian because I am. I'm not supposed to be. I am. And any tool I can put in my toolbox of salvation that helps me obey, I don't have a problem with. People say, that Christianity is a crutch. I say, no, it's not. It's a hospital, and I'm in intensive care. <laughs> I'm on life support. I am barely making it, folks. And I'm the pastor of the church, so what does that mean about y'all? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You guys, a lot of you are way beyond where I am, and that's fine. But Jesus had something to say about, about the people who know what the truth is and don't live it. He said in Matthew 23, verses 2 and 3, and this is from the NIV. He says, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. In other words, they have his authority over you. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. Now, does that sound like the words of Jesus, the way he and the Pharisees and teachers went at it? No, he says, you must do everything they tell you. But here's here's the asterisk. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. That's a huge, huge indictment. My sister posted a thing in the Lutheran church I used to go to, or we went as a family, and she wrote it and showed it to the pastor, and he allowed her to put it in the bulletin board that's outdoors so it's behind glass, just so stuff doesn't blow away. And it said, if you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Would enough people know just about how you live and the way you act and the way you respond and the way you're grateful to God and humble and all that, would would people know? Or would you get off scot-free? If non-believers don't see much difference between us and them, they don't see much reason to become a Christian. There's really not. This just in. Even if non-believers don't know of our secret sins, and they think we're a good example of what a Christian is, our secret sins are not secret to God. He knows all about every one of them, and that dishonors God because we're saying one thing and doing another, and he wants us to clean up our act. What does he say about obedience? Way back in the Old Testament, Samuel said this to um, King Saul, to obey is better than sacrifice. So you wanted to make a sacrifice. You weren't supposed to do that. You're the king. That's what I do. But you did it, and you were supposed to obey, and you didn't wipe out everyone. All these things he did, he said, hey, why is obedience better than a sacrifice? Because if you obey, there's no need for a sacrifice. <laughs> So it's better, obviously. So a good, godly teacher would not teach to break the law, but he himself should also not break the law. And this is why all that behavior is so bad, and we kind of covered it some already, but Paul says in 24, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. He's quoting Isaiah 52, verse 5. Just the fact that we say one thing and do another makes people go, God schmod in very loose and well-filtered, not naughty words in church language. You know what I'm saying? That's what, they, that's what God's like. I don't need that. I remember hearing about a woman who was doing horrible things with her young daughter, prostituting her out. And, of course, the counselor had to turn her in to the police when he heard about it. But before he did, he said, didn't you think, did you ever think of going to the church for help? She said, why would I go to the church? I already feel badly enough. And I thought, what an indictment against us, that that's what the world thinks. All we're trying to do is tell people they're bad and wrong. And yes, they are, but that's not the message. (laughs) Go into all the world and tell everyone how much of a scumbag they are. I'm sure that's not what Jesus said. No. Tell them about him. Tell them about his love, his grace, his mercy, the forgiveness of sin. It's the kindness of God that draws us in. We already went over that. Okay. But based on the bad behavior of people claiming to be working for God, representing God, but actually they're a wolf in sheep's clothing, God is thought of in a bad way by those who don't know him. As we used to say, God gets a bad rap. Remember that phrase? 
Well, I know a lot of people who wear clothing with their favorite sports teams on it. You know, I wear Boise State stuff. It's <coughs> SRAM stuff, and it's hard to wear that now. Oh, my goodness, because like watching a game with the Rams is like the Keystone Cops. It's like they're just going everywhere and running, and they wear uniforms that look good. They look just like an NFL team until the kickoff. <laughs> And I love this team. But there are times I look at that hat on my dresser and I go, not today, dude. I just, even I can't bring myself, to, I don't know how the players do. Anyway, but the slang that people have for that is they got to represent, you know. They represent their team. And the true fans are the ones that will even stand up right now in front of you all and say, the Rams are my NFL team right now. Now, back in 99, that was great. They won the Super Bowl. Yay. 16 years ago. Anyway, so, uh, but you stay with the team. There's no reason to, but you do. Well, as a Christian, wherever we go, whatever we do, we got to represent God. And it's interesting that the Bible also tells us to put on Christ, just like you put on that team logo stuff. Now, getting into a lot of the Judaism stuff, verse 25, for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. In other words, you obey the law completely, circumcision helps. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Oh, my goodness. You see, because circumcision is just a ritual, really. God initiated it, and it's a sign that his people were set apart for him. It also is a physical manifestation of the cutting away of the flesh, the old nature. You're getting rid of it. You don't need it anymore. You don't want it because it's, it goes against what God wants for you. But the Jews went way too far in their faith, not in God, but in circumcision. They believed just because they were physically circumcised, that made them saved. And here Paul is showing how wrong that belief is. Because if you break the law in your lifestyle, even though you're circumcised, that doesn't save you. If you think that that's what's going to get you through, you're very wrong. And then he says in 26, the opposite is true. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? So Paul is saying this. <laughs> if a man is not circumcised, in other words, a Gentile, but he keeps the righteous requirements of the law, even though he's not circumcised, he is saved. So he says this, between those two verses, Having the law or having a ceremony is not enough. God requires righteousness. That's what he wants from us. And he goes even further. Verse 27, Will not the physically uncircumcised, the Gentiles, if he fulfills the law, judge you who, even with your written code and circumcision, in other words, even with the law and circumcision, but you're a transgressor of the law? I bet the Jews who read this just about passed out right to what? That is so against what they knew in their hearts to be right. But Paul is simply confronting their hypocrisy. Gentiles who kept the law would judge Jews who broke the law. And as the music in a movie would go, dun, dun, dun. There's no way that could be true, but it's a valid point. If you depend on knowledge that's in your head and a physical ritual to save you, you're doomed. As people would say, you're toast. You're done. There's a ritual that we do today that Jesus actually told us to do. But this reminds me of that. It's baptism. Because many people today believe that baptism saves them. So they even bapt they go so far in some churches to baptize babies. When I was a baby, I was baptized in the Lutheran church. My parents took me there. They were doing what they believed to be the right thing. And I thanked them for doing what they believed in. But as I grew up, learn more about what the scripture says, I realize baptism is this. It's an outward expression that you go through that shows what has already happened in your heart. In your heart, you have died to self. You have gone in the grave, basically, and accepted Jesus as your Savior, and he brings you up out of there in newness of life. So that's what the physical baptism is for. It's showing what's already happened on the inside. One example of baptism doesn't save you is there anyone here who doesn't expect to go to heaven and see the thief that was on the cross next to Jesus? Did he get baptized? He said, Lord, remember me in your kingdom. He said, well, I would, but I can't. I'm kind of busy now. I can't take you down to the creek and baptize you. So sorry, dude, you're a little late. I'm not meaning to mock that, but that's, 
that's a pretty clear indication that baptism is not necessary for salvation. I think it's necessary to obey what God says, and I think every believer should be baptized. It's just, again, it was what went on the inside. Some people come up to me and say, I was baptized when I was, when I was a kind of a younger Christian, but I didn't really know what it meant. Can I get baptized again? I said, I think so. To me, it's like re-upping. I don't think you should get baptized every time we have a baptism either. But if you really didn't know and now you want to, sure. And if, it, if you didn't need to, it's not like God's going to go, oh, baptize twice and you didn't forward that email. Oh, you cannot get in. You know the emails I'm talking about. Forward this or you won't go to heaven. I'm like, oh, stop. I'm going to, I unfriend you, you know. Stop it. <laughs> I can't stop. <laughs> Anyway, but even being baptized as an adult, if that's all you do without the salvation thing, without actually asking Jesus to be your Savior, that doesn't save you. All you're doing is getting wet. That's why every person I baptize, you know what I say to them? Anyone who's been in here that said, why are you doing this? I ask that exact question. It doesn't matter if I know the person. It doesn't matter if I led them to the Lord and I heard them say the prayer and watch the evidence of Jesus in their life. I say, why are you doing this? The most precious answer I get, and you can't use this as a cheater if you haven't been baptized yet. You've got to come up with your own. But the most precious one I heard was, because I love Jesus. Yes. Okay, good job. So the people who depend on baptism as an infant to save them are in for a surprise. And there's another one, church attendance. Some people think, well, I went to church every Easter and a couple of Christmases. That should count something for God, you know? Stop. It's only a relationship with Jesus Christ that saves you. In fact, I've had people talk to me about religion, how much they don't like religion. And I say, neither do I. And sometimes people get shocked by that. (laughs) You're a pastor. How can you not like religion? I don't. I have a relationship with Jesus every day. I visit with him. Every day I talk with him. Every day he talks to me. Now, not Christopher. That's when I'm in trouble. Christopher Allen. Who? I'm really in trouble then. <laughs> that's why they gave me that middle name. But it's that relationship, the day-to-day walking with him that is what saves you. Actually, obviously his work on the cross and your acceptance of that saves you, but it maintains your relationship to be with him. So, verse 28. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor circumcision, that which is outward in the flesh. Paul says here that although circumcision actually happens physically, it's a spiritual circumcision we need. And this is where we turn to Deuteronomy chapter 10. If you want to, you can turn there if you marked it. And we'll pick it up in verse 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God to walk in all his ways and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth with all that is in it. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them and he chose their descendants after them. You above all peoples, as it is this day. Verse 16. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. And he goes on in that. But basically, how many things does God say in this that we are to do? I'll give you the answer in 12 and 13. Five things. Number one, we are to fear the Lord. Number two, walk in all his ways. Number three, love him. Number four, serve the Lord. And five, keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord. Now, it's an interesting thing. Nothing in scripture happens by mistake. So why do we have five there? I don't know if you know this. Numbers mean things in scripture. In scripture, the number five is a number of grace. So God gave the law Ten Commandments, but it can only condemn us. So in his grace, he accepts us based on the work of Jesus on the cross. And these are five things he asks us to do. And all five of these things fit into accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you do that by faith, because if he's your Savior, which means he is God and he's your God and he's capable of saving us, this is what we'll do in response to his grace. One, 
One, with a thumb, will fear the Lord. Two, walk in all his ways. Three, love him. Four, serve the Lord. And five, keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord. Now, there's one verse, if you're a student of Scripture at all in the book of Acts, you recognize it in verse 16. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. First of all, that ties in with what Paul said here, or he actually um, says it in the next verse we'll look at. But Stephen when he's making his defense before the council, he gets so frustrated and he says, you guys are uncircumcised in heart and ears. I think Stephen was thinking of this passage. You guys, you don't even listen to the things of God. I've shown you, he was saying, I've shown you from scripture so many examples that back up why we're doing what we're doing and you can't see it because of your rituals and all that. Okay, back in Romans 2, verse 29, the last verse. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter. Again, we need to be circumcised in the heart. We must cut away whatever keeps us from the Lord. And there are things that we do that separate us from God or cause problems. And that begins in the heart. Now, we might look good to people on the outside. You know, there was a time when I was working in a plumbing shop, and the guys were all talking about stuff they need to stop doing. And I'm like, yeah, I got stuff I need to quit doing. And they looked at me like I was from Mars like the cover of the book. Men are from Mars, right? They said, you are. What are you talking about? Because I didn't go drinking with them. I didn't go dancing in clubs with them. I didn't go to strip joints, all these things, which I think makes me a good Christian to not do those things, at least in the drinking in excess, the other things, you know. So to them, they're like, "You, you don't have anything to do. But you see, when you get rid of a lot of things in your life, then God focuses on the next thing. And a couple other things. And when those are removed, there's always more stuff to do as long as you're alive, more sin. And so to to you, that sin is huge. To them, it's not even on their radar. They're looking at the big, you know, it's like the Titanic iceberg in front of them. And you're saying, to them, there's this little thing that fell out of someone's drink. Well, that's not going to hurt the Titanic. (laughs) But for you, by the time God gets to that point, that has now become a big iceberg in your life. And it needs to be dealt with. So that's what I'm talking about here. We might look good on the outside, but 1 Samuel 16, 7, which is a different application of a verse where uh, Samuel was looking for uh, the next prophet. He says, For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. God's always looking at the heart. The heart of the matter always is. It's a matter of the heart. First, and the rest, he says, How you do it? You do it in the Spirit. Only through the Holy Spirit living in you can any part of us really be cut away and removed. It says in Ezekiel that I will give, put my spirit in you and I will cause you to obey my commandments and I will take out your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. So it's a pretty good deal. And the last part of the verse, whose praise is not from men but from God. Now this is interesting. First of all, to have praise from God is great. That means you're really doing well because if he praises you, you're doing well. But the name of their people, Jews, came from the name of Jacob's fourth son, Judah. And Judah, the name Judah means praise. So this could actually be a pun on the part of Paul when he wrote this. If you substitute Jew for praise and then do a little conjugation of the word, it could say this. Whose Jewishness is not from men, but from God. Instead of praise. And I think he's actually saying that because he's been talking about Jewishness through the whole section. Now, later in Romans 11, Paul talks about us Gentiles as being grafted in, which means here's like a plant that was Judaism, and some of those things got clipped off, and we got grafted in, and we're growing off of that. And sometimes he he warns us, we'll get to it. He warns us, like, don't get too cocky in that, like, oh, we're better than you, because the one who grafted you in can just as easily ungraft you again. (laughs) Exactly. And where are you drawing your strength from if you're grafted in? From that plant, right? Okay. So, that's how our Jewishness happens, even though we as Gentiles are not Jewish. William Barclay said this, The sense of this passage is that God's promises are not to people of a certain race and to people who bear a certain mark on their bodies. They are to people who live a certain kind of life irrespective of their race. To be a real Jew is not a matter of pedigree, but of character. And often the man who is not racially a Jew may be a better Jew than the man who is. See, real religion is a thing of the open door and the open heart. But Judaism is a thing of the shut door and the shut heart. And that's sad. 
I'll close with this verse from Galatians 6.15 from the New Living Translation. It doesn't matter whether we have been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for transforming us. We, the series of movies out in the last few years called Transformers, and they're fun to watch. But the real transformation, the genuine one that can happen in any person's heart is what is truly amazing. You take us and you change us. It doesn't matter if we're a Jew, if we're a Gentile, if we're circumcised or not. What you're concerned with is our heart. When we yield our heart to you and allow you to change it, that's when we get changed. That's when we get saved. And then the scriptures open up to us. The world of the spirit opens up to us. And the world and its allure and its attraction becomes less. We're still attracted to bright, shiny displays, God. We still sin. We still give in. But we give in a little less because we're giving in to you a little more. So thanks, God, for showing us these things from your word today. In Jesus' name, amen.